Morning, church. <laughs> morning, Prescott Valley. Welcome to you. Glad you are joining us this morning. We get to do this uh, journey together. Um, so this is Lewis, you guys. Yeah. And uh, I just thought it would be fun for him to uh, be a part. Uh, I, think, I think one of the things that, that you need to know about Lewis is He's the best part of my morning, one of the best parts of my morning, because I just can't wait to be able to sit with him, sit in the quiet of my house, uh, sit uh, in, a, in a moment with God. And, and every morning there's just this, um, by the way, he's going to be like some of y'all when the room's hot. Some of y'all are like, Whew. you know what I mean? So he'll be doing about the same thing, but um, don't worry, he's, he's fine. This is what he does. But, uh, but uh, here's the thing. So, so I just love, like for me, I love being in his presence. I, I love just that, that moment, the, the, the relationship that I have with him. Uh, some of you need to know he's my boy. I got all girls. And so he is the added testosterone to my house. Um, but I, I just, and here's the thing, right? Like, like, the relationship between him and I defines a whole bunch of stuff. And so part of, part of the relationship between him and I is that in this moment, knowing he was going to be here, I'm like, what can I do that would make him feel the most comfortable? What can I do that would make him feel that, that this moment for him, right, like that, that he's in, that he would get the best experience of this time? And so that chair is from home. It's his chair, right? And, and again, it's, it's, it's this idea of there's this relationship between him and I where because of who I am to him, he doesn't get a choice today where he's going to be. Right. He doesn't he doesn't have. Well, he has a choice. Actually, that's completely wrong. But he's he's got expectations on him. He, he's got things that he's being asked to do. And, and simply because of who I am to him. And, and so as we walk through this, right, one of one of the things I hope that you you kind of catch is there's these moments where you go, oh, oh, I see. Right. Because there's nobody in the room, I don't think, that would say, John, you don't have the right to put an expectation on him. You go, no, as as he is your dog. You can tell your dog what? The best place to be to experience the best thing. What's the relationship between him and I? Where, what is the the recommendations for him and I? It's coming out of a spot of what? I have deep love for him. But I have expectations. I have deep love for him, but there are things he needs to do. And if you've been with us last week, you know, we kicked off this collection of talks and, and um, the big idea behind it, if you missed it, is that he is, Jesus is the center of all things. Like period, There's a, it's not up for debate. That Jesus is the center of everything. We talked about this idea of, of being um, created by Jesus, right? And so that answers the big who am I question of life. That you were created by Jesus. That's who you are, right? That, that you have a creator and it's not you. That you have a creator and that creator then is the one that gives you purpose because then we're told that you were created by him and for him. And so you just answer two massive questions of life. And we talked about this idea that if we get Jesus out of the center, right? Then everything else goes off. If I forget that my life is for him, then it won't be long till I'm living for the wrong things. And so the idea is that we understand who Jesus is. And like a record, we talked about a record last week, right? That at the center, if you get that, that middle point off on that record, it does not work and it will become destructive. And when we get Jesus out of the center, even out of the center of the way we view scripture, we will miss and it will become destructive. And so we started last week, we're just going to take, um, it's looking like we're going to take a couple of months to walk through some of these stories that you may be familiar with and go, you know, that's actually telling you about Jesus, 
Because the entire book is pointing to who Jesus is and the difference he makes in our lives. The entire book is pointing to his supremacy over all. And so we started last week with creation and we said, God's the creator owner, right? And, and out of that, he had some expectations. And those expectations were specifically for the first two humans, Adam and Eve. And part of Adam and Eve's journey is they, they sin and step away from God. And we discover grace in the third chapter where God takes an animal. We discover substitution in the third chapter where God takes an animal and it sits in the place of the humans because the humans, the humans should have died. And God goes, instead, I'm going to clothe your shame. I'm going to clothe your guilt. I'm going to clothe your brokenness. And he takes the skin of an animal and clothes them. It required sacrifice. In the third book, third chapter, you have in the first book, you have God already setting the foundation for what's to come, that it will be by substitution and sacrifice. That, that we move to the next chapter, right? And it's, it's Cain and Abel, these two brothers. And what we learn from the two brothers is in their story that you can't come to God any way you want, that God has a specific way you need to come to him. That it's not just however you choose your own adventure, that does not work with God that God sets down very clear that there is a way that he has for you to come. And so today we're just going to kind of continue on with this journey. We're in chapter six of Genesis. And in chapter six, verse five, it says this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And so we're only six chapters in. Roughly, they, they think it was 10 generations. And within 10 generations, we have gone from uh, that it was individual sin to systemic sin. That it's affected everything. And God looks at the human race and he goes, hey, every inclination of their heart is the opposite of what I want and the opposite of who I am. Everything I created them for to get the best experience out of this, this creation is gone because their heart is only evil all the time. Excuse me. Carries on then in verse six. The Lord regretted, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. The God of love that created out of love, regretted that he had made humans. That's a heavy, heavy, heavy verse. Verse seven, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah finds grace. So you have God and God is making this proclamation, right? He's making this, this, this known that I regret that I've made them. And so I'm gonna wipe them off the face of the earth. And it says, but Noah found grace. We love grace, right? We, we read that verse and grace maybe stands out like, oh, I like grace. But what's interesting is we sometimes struggle with the story of Noah. Like culturally, culturally around the story of Noah, it can be really easy, it can be really easy to begin to look at Noah like Noah's a myth. Right? It can be really easy to look at Noah and go, oh yeah, when my kids were little, we put a rainbow on the wall and we had these animals that were all so cute and we had this ark, right? And so it becomes kind of this nursery rhyme or a, or a myth. And it becomes really hard when, when questioned from outside the church, or maybe you've got your own questions, like how does this fit? And, and so I just want to show you what, what's affirmed within scripture. Because if you jump to Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, you have Jesus affirming the story of Noah. And so in verse 36, it says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, 
but only the Father. As it was, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. So that is how it will be with at the coming of the Son of Man. And so Jesus affirms the historical, the historical person of Noah and the historical nature of the flood. What what you get with what you get with Jesus in this moment is Jesus affirms, he doesn't speak about it as a myth. He doesn't speak about it as, hey, you remember that story that your parents told you? He just goes as it was in the days of Noah. And so you have Jesus affirming the story of Noah. You you jump to Peter, and so Peter, one of the disciples closest to Jesus, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, it says, after being made alive, he went, after Jesus being made alive, Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So so what do you have with Peter? Peter affirms what? The historical data that we have about the story of Noah. He affirms what's in Genesis 6. And so there's affirmation being given by the Bible about the Bible and about the person of Noah. Because here's here's the thing with Noah. If you are comfortable with the story of Noah, something's wrong with you. It's not a comfortable story. It's God saying, I'm going to wipe everybody out. But there's this guy, Noah, who's found grace, right? In in Hebrews, the writer in Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became the heir, the, the heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. The writer in Hebrews affirms what? In the hall of faith. So right alongside guys like Abraham, Moses, David, he affirms in that passage the faith of Noah. And specifically, he says he had faith to things that were unseen. What he's saying is Noah had never seen rain. Noah had never seen a flood. Noah had never seen what was to come. And yet he had the faith to step into what God called him into. It's it's amazing that that we, we struggle because we don't like something. Right? We, we struggle with the nature of Noah because, because there's something in there that, that we want to sit in a position that's not ours to sit. Right? We, we, we don't like the judgment of God. We, we don't like to talk about the fact that God is a judge. God has the right to judge. Right? Just, just like in this context, because of the relationship I have with him, if he does something I do not like, I have the right to what? Judge that. And you may be going, well, I wouldn't do that with my dog. He ain't your dog. Right? And the same applies with God. Right? We are God's people. We are his creation. We are his humanity. And God gets to decide what the rules are. God gets to decide what the expectations are. We don't get to choose that. God gets to decide what is best to get the best experience out of this life. The patience of God that that Peter taps into, the patience of God that he says, they they, they think, right? And we'll get to the ark part in a second. But they think that it took roughly, they argue over it in in Christian circles, 75 years or 125, somewhere in there. That's a long time for God to continue to watch every inclination of the human heart be against everything he's got for them. And he patiently waits and he waits and he waits and he waits. 
It is, it's beautiful. And so if you jump back to Genesis 6, verse 9 says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So, so the idea of righteousness in that context is not right standing with God, that he was innocent, right? So when God's looking at humanity and he's seeing uh, this group with every intent is evil. He's seeing something different in Noah that that's not the case. That Noah is innocent. He's not doing the things. He's morally different. And then it says that he's blameless. And that has to do with your interactions with people. That with the people around him, he was blameless with them. And then he says that he walked faithfully with God. And that idea of walking faithfully is that he was in dependency on God. The only other person to this point is, if you're familiar with Enoch, Enoch's the only one that said that he has walked faithfully with God. The same language as you've known, and it has to do with his dependency on God. Noah, verse 10, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end. So now God is voicing it to Noah. I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening of one cubit high all around. And so what we get with Noah is we get God going, hey, I'm going to destroy everything. But Noah, you need to build an ark. Now we hear ark and what do we think of? Boat, right? But to this point, there has been no boating activities that we know of, right? There is no rain that we know of as rain. The, the, the best we have is in Genesis. It talks about the, 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 the springs watered the earth, the mist of the springs. And so at this point, Noah steps in to build something that was 400, get this, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And to, to the best of our knowledge, right, there's no blueprints for this. It's just God telling him, this is what you're going to do. What I love about the word ark is that there's a connection to the Egyptian language is where it comes from. Its roots are in the Egyptian language. And where it comes out of, there is a connection to that word that means coffin. And coffin is an amazing word for what Noah built. Because we think that Noah built boats like we have them, where the front is rounded and the back is the way it needs to be. This was a box. And this box had no rudder. The only person in control of where this boat went was God himself. <clears throat> and so what he's told him in this, in this moment is, hey, you need to build essentially a coffin. Now, what's amazing with a coffin? You put who inside of it? Dead people. What is God going to do with the entire earth? It says that he's going to destroy it through water which that's fascinating, right? Because we hear destroy and we think, oh, it's obliterated. But no, he's renewing it by what? By water. He's renewing it back to the purpose he intended. And Noah, outside of a coffin, he's just a dead man. And so it's this moment where God is building, building a picture for us that this coffin is designed to preserve life. And so it carries on then. Middle of that verse 16, put a door, put a door. How many doors? A door, super important. Put a single door, single door in the side of the ark and make a lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm not sure which deck would have been the best. 
right? Is it more stinky on the lower deck or the upper deck? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all of life under heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on the earth will perish. But I, but I, but I, this is who God is, but I will establish my covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. God's saying, I'm making an agreement with you. I'm making an obligation to you that I will not break. What is that obligation as he carries on? And you will enter the ark, right? He's establishing this, this covenant, this obligation. You and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. You are to bring to the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Is some, something we need to know, church, is when God brings judgment, he always brings salvation. When God brings judgment, there's always salvation. And in this moment, you, you may be going, I don't know if I like the judgment that is coming. I don't know if I agree with God sitting in it. But what you need to understand about the character and nature of God, that anywhere we see judgment in scripture, there is always an offer of salvation along with it. I mean, think about it for a second. Noah's building this boat. I mean, can you get a bigger beacon to a whole bunch of people? Right? Can you, can, can, like at some point, Peter says they just carried on with their lives around Noah building this giant box. I, you wonder, how do they miss it? Right? Does anybody ever have that feeling when you read this story going, what were the people thinking? But we have nowhere in this story that God is going, if someone else would have come along and gone the way God wanted them to, we have nothing to say they wouldn't have been included in the ark. Because God's judgment always has an offer of salvation. Always. And here's the thing, he's, he's God. He's God. And what we do is we, we don't like, we don't like, right? We, we don't like the, well, I don't know if that's fair. Well, I hate to break it to you. You're not God and you're not the judge. You see, he's been sitting there quite a while. He knows I'm talking about him, huh? But if he sits there the whole time, he'll get this. And I'm not going to say the word because he'll, he'll get a little more intense. But I'm just going to place it right here. And if he stays where he is, he'll get it. But if he, if he doesn't, he's not going to get it. And some of you right now just went, aw, on the inside, Right? But my relationship to him determines what I can do. My relationship to him determines the reward. But I have expectations. And you realize with, with God, and when the offer of salvation comes, he has expectations. Because all the people around, listen, listen to what it was for at the end of that verse, end of verse 19. To keep them alive with you. And that carries on. To every kind, to every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. Church, what was the purpose of the coffin? to keep life alive, to preserve. God has created a way that even through judgment, there is preservation of life. That is what the ark is all about. The ark was designed to preserve life because God knew the judgment that had to come because it was so opposite of who he is and his character and his nature. And so inside of his nature and his character, he goes, I cannot allow this to be. I cannot allow humans 
to live in this way anymore. This is not what I created them for. I have to start again and I will preserve life through a box. Verse 21, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and food for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Verse four, seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Verse 16, the animal, animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then, then the Lord shut them in. Then the Lord, who closes the door? God. God closes the door. God is the one who seals them safely inside. But what we need to understand about God is that God has provided a way. And as he seals them inside, there is one door and God calls time on when that door closes. But you know what's amazing, right? That when you begin to flesh out this story, does anybody, anybody see the center of it all? the center of all things, which is the person of Jesus. Right, all the way back in Genesis 3, God sets judgment in place. He goes, the penalty for sin is death. God hasn't changed. It's set in motion way back here. The judgment for sin is death. And what does God do? God provides a way for what? Preservation of life. How? Through the person of Jesus Christ. What happens? Then the concept of the ark you have on this side, death and destruction, brokenness and sin, the worst of humanity. And what does God do? He takes it and he puts it in a box to preserve it through judgment. He preserves it all the way through judgment. Why? So that Noah, it says later, that Noah walked out onto dry land. When the floodwaters receded, life, Noah steps out of the ark into new life. Oh, is there it's the connections that hopefully are just flying? That we go from death and destruction and brokenness and sin and our hate, and through the person of Jesus, we're preserved through judgment. That God would look at us and go, you know what? You're not guilty because he's already paid for it. I mean, what a beautiful day. We get, to, we get to stand before God in his presence. And he goes, I don't know. He, he, he's not going to ask you this, I don't think. Why should I let you stay? You know what we're going to have, right? That preservation right there. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because when he went to the cross, I went to the cross with him. When he was buried, I was buried with him. When the floodwaters covered him and death and decay, what happened? When he walked out of that tomb into new life, I walked out of that tomb into new life. You walked out of that tomb into new life. You were preserved through death. Why? So that Jesus talks about it over and over, this idea of eternal life in the kingdom of God. That the kingdom is now. Why is it now? Because death has been defeated. You've already been carried through the waters of judgment in the person of Jesus, which is why the New Testament writers kept saying it's in him, in him, in him. You are in him. Where's your life? In him. What does that sound like? Like you're inside of a life preserver, right? You're inside of a coffin. And the coffin has carried you where the tomb carried you to life in the person Jesus is, is the container that's carried you 
to life. One more verse in John chapter 14. Church, I know some of you have been in church a long time, but if that doesn't get your blood going, nothing is gonna get your blood going. Can I just tell you that if Jesus and what he has saved us from does not get you excited and does not get you fired up, we have missed something, church. Like if, if, if somewhere along the way we become so callous to the good news of the gospel, we have lost the plot because the entire story is about the good news of Jesus and who he is and how he changes us. And so along the way, right, like the disciples, he's telling them he's got to go. And the disciples are like, where are you going? And in verse six of chapter 14, it says, Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to the language. No one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds an awful lot like a what? A door. Just like there was one door on the ark, there is one door that gets you into the presence of, fa of the Father in relationship with him. And it's Jesus Christ. And that's it. Hey, you know what I love? He's had a choice the whole time. Right? He's had a choice. He could get down. He didn't have to listen. He didn't have to do what I wanted him to do. But he's had a choice. And what's fascinating about the gospel is this that it provides with choice. You have a choice. What I love about God, God's a gentleman. God, God wants you to respond out of love. God's not gonna force you to do something. He's not gonna force you to walk through the door that is Jesus into life. He's not gonna force that. But he has said this, that judgment is, judgment is real and it is coming. And we don't know the day, as Jesus said, when that time is up. I hate to tell you, we don't even know if we get out of this room because we're not in control. Only the Father knows the time is what Jesus said. Only God knew when to close the door of the ark. And I, I don't know how you've been with God. I don't know where you, you kind of fall in your journey with God, but, but I, I dare wonder how many of you keep going, there's time, there's time. I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not ready for that. And you just keep putting it off. You keep putting off a decision with Jesus because you think there's time. I dare say in the days of Noah, as they were just living their life, they thought there was time. What's interesting with choice, none of you could help him today. Right, my daughter's dogs couldn't help him. Nobody could help him with the choice and the expectations that were put on him. He's, he's the only one that can do that. You're the only one that can stand before Almighty God, who is your creator, owner, sustainer, life giver, the lover of your soul. And where he has set judgment in place, he has set salvation in place and rescue. And there is a door today and you have a choice. And so I, I would feel remiss like I have not been faithful if we don't stop and give you a chance to go, hey, I, I need to step through that door today. I need Jesus to save me. I need him to carry my sin and the weight of my sin. I need him to take me from death to life. And so I'm gonna ask you, if you would, if you would just um, bow your head, close your eyes. Those of you in Prescott Valley, um, I'm gonna ask you to do the exact same this morning. It's just a moment of privacy. for you to contemplate. For you to, you to work through, Lord, where am I today? I'm gonna ask you as you contemplate, have I stepped through the door? That is Jesus. Have I said yes to Jesus? 
if I ask Jesus to rescue me? If you haven't, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. And it's real simple. I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. There's nothing unique about it, but there's something that happens when internally we know we need to react to what God is talking to us right now. We need to react. The physical response just cements what's happening internally. So I'm gonna to count to three and then ask you to raise your hand. One, God loves you very, very much. Two, you will never be the same because of Jesus. Three, if that's you, would you just raise your hand this morning? Just hold your hand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd love to pray over you this morning. God, thank you for your story. God, thank you for your love for us. God, thank you for not abandoning us. You could have quit. You could have said enough. And yet, God, you didn't. But you still held judgment in place, but you provided a way. God, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for providing a way. Thank you that your love that some would deem reckless. God, your love has crossed the universe to reach souls today here in this room across our, to our brothers and sisters in Prescott Valley. God, you've reached across today and you have rescued people afresh. You have raised them to new life. God, we celebrate the new life and what you are doing and what you have done. And so God, I pray over those that raised their hand in both locations today. I pray God that you would meet them in this moment. You would give them the courage to take the steps forward in their faith in following you. I pray that you would encourage them to tell somebody today. I pray that we would celebrate with them. And God, we're grateful that you, you are our God and we are your people. It is you we worship today. You are righteous and holy. But above all, you love us deeply. And so God, we just say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody said, amen.